Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks on Everything Cooperative. We are talking to you this morning about co-ops and why the, the benefits of them, how they work, what's the uh, functions of cooperative, what types of businesses can be cooperative. We have a great rainy day today, and we blessed with rain so that it can grow our crops, and we would like to grow businesses that can help people. And today we have on the line with us this morning, Judy Sullivan. Good morning, Judy. Good morning, Vernon. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? Thank you, and thanks for taking out time to talk with us about co-ops and your role in co-ops. How, how long have you been working with co-ops, and how did you get involved in them? Oh, boy, about almost 30 years ago. Um, and I got involved. I've been doing government relations work, but I was looking for something part-time, and they had a director of government relations position open. So I applied for it, and I have a pretty strong background in government relations. I worked with Van Ness Feldman on energy and environmental issues, so I'm pretty familiar with the process. And, you know, I'm very interested in housing issues, and to be honest, I really like cooperatives. Fantastic. So, um, Me too. <laughs> I know. Good people, you know. I've, I enjoy working with them, so. So what makes you like cooperatives? I think it's spirit of working together. You know, I'm in various coalitions, one with the Cooperative Bank that's a, a tax coalition. I'm in a multi-housing family coalition. But, you know, I just like the idea of people working together for common goals. And when you talk about the bank, you're talking about National Cooperative Bank. And, yes. And um, Chuck Snyder, who's been on the program, is the president of NCB said a co-op is nothing but people helping people. He just made it very simple. People mm-hmm. helping people. And that's what you like. Listen, what is government relations and what do you do in this world? Well, I pay attention to issues that are of interest to housing cooperatives. And I then, you know, report back to the National Association of Housing Cooperatives uh, Government Relations Committee. And then we make decisions about, you know, what we're going to cover. And then we identify uh, public policy issues that we want to address. And then I keep them informed of bills that are introduced. Sometimes it's a defensive strategy. Here are the things that we need to protect ourselves from. So I lobby Congress. I keep members informed of issues that are of interest to housing cooperatives. Sometimes I do research, you know. Mm -hmm background information. So, you know, it's it runs the gambit. It really just depends. They also work with, you know, these various coalitions. So so then we work together, the multifamily housing um, coalition that I work with, we pay attention to HUD budgets and, you know, try to influence members of the House and Senate housing committees, you know, that, that we need more funding for particular programs. Um, or sometimes it's just weighing in on, you know, fairness issues. So I don't know. There's so much involved in this. <laughs> well, we could have another conversation about just that. Well, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to start there is because I did not understand until I started working with you in National Association of Housing Co-ops what government relations is all about and how it functions. And I would think a lot of people out there in Radio Oland does not know and lobbying has gotten a very bad reputation. Well, you're absolutely right, but people forget. There are, you know, good guys and bad guys, and it's funny. I was I was out somewhere, and, and someone introduced themselves and said that they were a lobbyist, and right away, you know, the little group that I was with said, oh, are you one of the good guys or the bad guys? We kind of know, you know, who's who. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, democracy.
policy is about participatory government. And, you know, if you don't weigh in, you get hurt. So, um, and I don't know, do you think of an organization like AARP as the bad guys? I, I don't. I mean, usually they're strong lobbyists, and I think it's for, uh, you know, the good of senior citizens. I think young people ought to have a, a lobbying um, organization group that mm-hmm. would uh, represent them in terms of, you know, college debt. Um, you know, it's like that's how you get things done. It takes a long time. It's a, it could be a, a slow process. But if you don't organize and you don't weigh in, you will get hurt. You know, I like this. Democracy is participatory government. And we'd like to see more people participate, like just voting, but to get in and get the issues, understand the issues, and then when they vote, they can have uh, an informed uh, decision-making process. So I really I like that piece that you've talked about. And that's why I wanted to start here, because lobbying does have a very bad reputation. And as I have gotten to know you, and I'll just say this in, in public, I have a sense that you love co-ops and housing, And my sense of you is that you do much more work for National Association of Housing Co-ops than you ever get paid for or ever will because we just don't have the kind of money to pay you to do the research, to have an offensive strategy to go after funding for HUD or any laws that would help uh, housing co-ops or the defensive strategy when you're looking and reading about what laws are being passed that would hurt housing co-ops. You're on top of it and you keep us informed. So thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, you know, I think that that's true. I try to give the National Association of Housing Cooperatives the most bang for the buck. There's a lot that you can do in terms of lobbying that are, you know, worthwhile but not crucial. So I try to do things that are crucial. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. And and even and I think that you know. Um, NAHC has been good to me, so I don't have any complaints there. Issues that are interesting or interested that housing co-ops could be involved in is what you deal with. So what are some of those issues? Well, uh, one has to do with disaster relief. We recognized after Hurricane Sandy that housing cooperatives, um, the common areas, so the hallways, the basements, the multi-purpose rooms, the furnace, the roof, all of those things were not covered under the disaster relief. Let's see, uh, for a single-family homeowner, all those things would be covered. But they separate uh, the unit from the common area. So the unit was entitled to disaster relief grants. And grants are, are given in a disaster, but they don't have to be paid back. So now, this is FEMA? This is FEMA. Okay. And the reason why this is important to cooperatives is because the common areas would have to apply for uh, small business loans, and those do have to be paid back. And in a disaster, they're very difficult to get. So, you know, we're trying to get full coverage for the building, the same as single-family homeowners get. Their roofs, their basements, everything is covered. Um, And FEMA does not necessarily, they don't necessarily oppose our changes. And I should point out that this also uh, affects condominiums and homeowners associations. So FEMA doesn't necessarily oppose us. It's just that under their Stafford Act, they need a legislative fix, is what we call it, to have common areas covered. And that's all we're trying to do is get this legislative fix. You know, you have to follow the law. Judy, let me go back. Let me go back. So so Sandy hits or Katrina hits or there's a snowstorm or whatever. There's some major disaster. And if you live in a single-family house, then you can get grant money from FEMA to fix up whatever is broken in the house, the roof, the windows, the whatever, floors messed up. You can get grants. Is that right first? That's correct. Okay. And then secondly, though, if you live in a condominium or a um, cooperative or a 
homeowners association. There's a lot of homeowner associations around Washington, D.C. So if you live in any of these, then you can get money for the unit, but not the for the common your, area. The inside of your unit. Did I hear you correctly? Yeah, but it would be the inside of the unit only. You oh. can apply for a FEMA grant. So if the siding came off your house, you can't get that. If the roof comes off, you can't get it. If the window's broken by wind damage or something hitting, you, you can't get relief with those things. Right. Yep. Any, yeah. And any of the common areas, the basement, you know, the furnace, the washer dryers, whatever you have down there, you cannot get it. The hallways. So that's correct. You would have to apply, you know, to, for a small business loan. Well, it seemed like if it's a... Oh, I guess for a condominium or a cooperative, they're considered a business. It was a small business loan and not just a mortgage? Right. That's correct. And I would imagine they're hard to get and expensive? They're hard to get. Uh, you know, they have to be paid back. The grants do not. So, you know, those are those are the reasons why we're interested in this issue. Okay. All right. So... What do you do now? You've got, you got this problem for cooperatives, this multifamily ownership, cooperatives, condominiums, HOAs, homeowner associations. So what do you then do now that you've, you've identified a problem and as a government representative, what, what are the steps that you would take? Well, Representative Israel's office has been very helpful on this issue. He, he has actually taken the lead. And on October 29th, he introduced a bill, H.R. 3863, and this bill would take care of our problem in terms of these common areas. Judy, can I get you to hold, and we'll come back and talk about uh, Representative yeah. Israel. We'll need to take our first break. If anybody out there would like to call in, you can call in at 1-800-450-7876. If you have a question or a comment about cooperatives or lobbying or this FEMA issue. Please call us. We'll be right back. Fourteen fifty W O L. Information is power. That's W O L's motto, and that's why they make a great partner for us because we're giving you the information that if you would use this information about cooperatives, you would get power. Power power to solve problems in your communities, people coming together. And Judy Sullivan is our guest today, and she said that's why she likes co-ops, because people come together. It's a spirit of working together. And this is the spirit that caused co-ops to outperform the normal businesses because people are working together. And I say outperform when you start a, a co-op, they don't fail as often as, they don't, as fast as a regular, a regular business. So, Judy, we were talking about working with Congress, and you said Representative Israel. But, but what I was asking you was, when you found out about this problem, what did you do as a representative of NAHC, National Association of Housing Co-ops? Well, we contacted members of the New York congressional delegation um, because Hurricane Sandy, you know, really hit some of those districts. And Representative Israel's office was very responsive. Uh, we contacted FEMA, uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, to alert them to the problem. We are part of a coalition with the Community Associations Institute. They represent condominiums and uh, the Homeowners Association. But we also brought in the National Cooperative Bank and the National Cooperative Business Association. So, you know, all of those groups, you know, helped to weigh in. We met with Congressman Israel's office. He agreed to introduce the legislation, and um, I should have mentioned, too, uh, the Consumer Federation of America is also part of this coalition. Okay. Um, and so we met uh, with him. He agreed to introduce the legislation. He asked us to help find uh, what's called original co-sponsors. So those are other members that would agree to sign on to this bill, and we did that. And he, as I said, introduced uh, a bill. He, he introduced one um, last session of Congress, but um, that bill did not go through. I mean, 90% of all bills die in committee, and, and so 
Um, if it's not acted on within that Congress, then it dies. So he reintroduced um, a bill this year, this H.R. 3863, and we currently have 15 co-sponsors. I sent out a call to action for members of housing cooperatives to, to weigh in with their members of Congress on this issue. And then a Congressman in Israel's office gave us a deadline. He told us on a Monday we're going to drop the bill on Thursday and we need the co-sponsors. And so I quick, you know, sent emails, made telephone calls to as many representatives as I could. And um, so, you know, we have 15 co-sponsors. So, Two so- of them, I should point out, are on the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, which is where this bill was sent. And so, you know, that's significant because they're the ones that can offer amendments on the bill when the committee takes it up. So, you know, we're, we just work through the process to try to get, you know, something accomplished here. So working through the process, you really have to understand the process. You have to understand government, how it works. And I guess you have to get relationship with the people so that you'll know they'll know you and you will know them when you call. So here, there is a problem. There is an issue. And that issue is when a storm comes, people cannot get uh, grant money to help solve the problem. And that's what FEMA is there for. So that's people that's in multifamily cooperatives, condominiums, and HOA. So you built coalitions. you got different groups to come together with NAHC or to build up this political might, if you will, this political power. And you go to Congress members and you get somebody to say, yep, I'll create a bill. And that was Representative Israel because there's so many housing co-ops in New York, condominiums. There's so many multifamily uh, buildings and people living in these buildings in New York. So he wants to represent his people, the people that voted for him and took him to office. So he creates a bill that helps them. So this is a good guy. So you're saying I got, the people have a problem. Oh, matter of fact, I heard a definition of democracy. Matter of fact, I read in the book that democracy is people. No, politics is people coming together to solve a problem, a community problem. That's true. I like that definition. I never thought of it that way before because of all of the bad things we hear about politicians. But there are good politicians just like good lobbyists and good people and bad people. And so when people come go into politics to help solve community problems, and here we have a community problem that affects people in multifamily when there's a storm, and we seem to be getting more of them with climate change. I believe in climate change. I, I believe in the science. <laughs> okay. So, so we get all of these storms, and so now we have people coming together to solve it. You get a group of people, the, the people that were elected, in this case Congressman Israel, said, okay, I'm going to create a bill to help solve this community problem. Uh, so when when there are disasters, people can get relief. Fantastic. Yes, we're trying to amend a law, the Stafford Act, and so that's how you do it. And you know, I, I'm always uh, let's see. I like to do advocacy work, um, but I'm still not sure exactly what motivates people to contact their members of Congress. It's like if you don't, we won't get anything done. If you do, we can get something done, even in, you know, I mean, we do have a dysfunctional Congress, but um, but some things uh, are accomplished, and the only way you can accomplish them is by weighing in. I mean, the more people that care about an issue and contact their member of Congress, and you just have to send a quick email. It's so easy, I can't believe it. Um, uh, the more likely you are to have outcomes that um, that benefit you. So what we want is anybody out there that lives in a condo, a co-op or condominium or a housing association, homeowner association, to send an email to your congressperson and say support H.R. 3863. That's right. Um, they can specifically ask them to co-sponsor it. Once somebody co-sponsors it, they, that means they're on board. And they keep adding, even though, you know, it's important to have original co-sponsors, they will keep adding co-sponsors. It's such an easy thing to do. And uh, to be honest, no one objects to this change that we're asking for. Um, 
it's just a matter of getting it done. So it's what we call a legislative fix. Um, and it doesn't cost any more money. Um, the money is allocated to FEMA, and then they allocate it to different disasters. So uh, it won't change that amount. And that's significant, particularly with this Congress. Um, you know, they're always asking, now, how much does it cost? And there is not, there is no additional cost in terms of this bill. I, I think that people don't call or email their congressperson because they don't think that their email will make a difference. Um, even if they care. And I, and I said people that live in a multifamily, but I would say even if you don't live in a multifamily situation, you may live in a single family home. If you think there's something wrong that you can get money to fix your house if there's a storm, a single family house, and you would like your neighbor down the street that lives in a multifamily to be able to get. They own cooperatives are owned by the individuals who live in the units, and condos are owned by the individuals, and homeowner associations are owned by the people that live in there. So if if you like that, you can get help if if there's a disaster, and you would want your neighbor to, whether your neighbor is across the street, or across town, or across country. If you want your neighbor to get help, then you I would encourage you to email your congressperson. Now, how can they find the address for their congressperson? Um, you know, there's an easy website. It's called Contacting the Congress. And so you go there and you click on your state and then you put in your zip code and it, your member of Congress will show up. You click on their name and all of the congressional websites have a link that says, you know, contacting me. And then you just you know, do that. I mean, it's kind of a good exercise to just figure out how do I contact them. But honestly, it couldn't be easier. <laughs> it really is. So um, there's another issue here, too, though. I mean, first of all, motivating people to do something that's in their best interest. But also, you just don't know when a disaster is going to hit. <laughs> right. And so far, it's taking us two years to implement this at least two years, because it's, it hasn't been done yet. So, and, and nothing will be done retroactively. That's not in this bill. So, you know, you're, you're always taking a chance that, you know, if something happens in the interim before this bill is enacted in, into law, it, it's a problem. <laughs> it's a huge problem. And, you know, it's one of those things where you find out afterwards, oh, too bad I didn't weigh in. You yes, know? that happens a lot. And we have to take our second break. Okay. Again, if you would like to call in, if you have a question or comment, call in at 1-800-450-7876. We're talking about working with Congress and getting bills passed as it relates to co-ops, but as it relates to anything. So please call in and don't touch that dial. 1450 WOL. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. You know, um, National Cooperative Bank sponsors this program. The NCB's mission is to help cooperatives grow by supporting and being an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, placing special emphasis on serving the needs of communities that are economically challenged. And they, they have a, a massive mission because most bankers are wanting to go into communities that have economic strength and power and great net worth because they want to make sure they get their money paid back. So NCB has found ways of going into communities that are economically challenged and being able to help cooperative form or the co-ops that are there to help solve community problems. So they, they're doing very, very well. And Judy Sullivan is our guest today. She works with government relations with the National Association of Housing Co-ops, and she works with NCB and other coalitions to get to solve community problems. And the one we've been talking about is when there is a disaster, whether it's a, a storm. You know, we know Sandy hit the East Coast and Katrina hit New Orleans and Mississippi. So when these storms happen, uh, FEMA is the organization that comes in and helps 
support people, but so far they will give money to single-family homes. And for these other units, they will do work on the inside, but not anything on the outside or common areas. And so this, there's a new bill out, H.R. 3863, so I'm summarizing what we've talked about earlier. And you can go to contactingthecongress.org, contacting, C-O-N-T-A-C-T-I-N-G, T-H-E-C-O-N-G-R-E-S-S. And while we had the last break, Judy, I did that. Oh, my goodness, yeah, and how'd it go? Well, I, I went in, and a map showed up, and I, because I live in D.C., I clicked on D.C., and it came up with Eleanor Holmes Norton as the person and her telephone number, her fax number, and her email address. I clicked on the email, and then it asked me for my zip code to make sure I was in her area, okay, that she really represented me. So I did that, and then it came, that was step one, and then step two was write the message. So I put my name and telephone number and address and my email address, and so then it said, what's, what's the message? Now, what I haven't been able to do, so I haven't sent this, was it says, please select the issue. And so I was thinking it might be housing and urban development or... Yep, that's it. That's it? Mm-hmm. So let me click on that. And then I wrote the message, please support and co-sponsor H.R. 3863 to give co-ops, condos, and HOAs the same protection as single-family homeowners. Well, Vernon, you get a gold star. Well, you know, sometimes... You, you need to walk me through. And I've gotten those emails. I've sent them. I forward them, and I will do more of that. You've sent out emails to ask us all to do this. So I did it. I got my gold star, and I will see if I can get some other people. If you listen to me, you can go to contactingthecongress.org. It was the most simplest thing I have done in a long time. <laughs> Yeah, it's an easy way to do it. It's also good for people to know who their representative is in Congress, you know, and I pay attention to issues every day. I get, you know, I'm, I subscribe to various uh, groups that, you know, will alert me when something comes up. But, you know, there, it's like pay attention, I guess, to to issues that you think might be of interest to you. And it's not that difficult. And after a while, it, you you start to understand how things work. And I, I think it's very helpful what's going on in Congress or in this town or what, what might impact you. So thank you, Vernon, for, for weighing in. Well, I got after I sent Sin, I got a note back saying, thank you, Vernon Oaks. Your message has been sent. I did ask for them to contact me. Bye. You will. And yeah, and I, I, if nothing else, I wanted them to know they got it. This already tells me that they got it. Is yeah. there a place you could go to find out who the co-sponsors are? Because that was what I was thinking about. Has she already co-sponsored it? Well, there's an interesting website. I, I actually love it. It's great. It's called Thomas, and it's it's named after Thomas Jefferson, and it's the Library of Congress. And you can go to library to Thomas, and then it will ask you, um, what are you searching for? And you can do it by a word or phrase or by a bill number. So if you, uh, you know, click bill number and then insert HR 3863, it will, uh, uh, it will show you there are various links. One is for the text of the legislation. Um, I don't think there's a summary on this one. It's actually a short bill. I think it's only three pages. And and then it also lists the co-sponsors. Okay, so I went to any, I went to Google and hit Thomas, and a lot came up. You and just so, want Library of Congress Thomas. It's usually the first one. Well, what I hit was Thomas.gov, and something came up, and then I hit uh, well, it said current legislation, and I put in HR. 3863, and it says 114th Congress Disaster Assistance Equity Act of 2015. And the sponsor, I don't see the co-sponsors yet. I have Representative Israel. Okay. So that was a... Well, just try uh, searching Thomas. Just that. That's all I ever do, Thomas. And then it should come up, Library of Congress. Okay. So we have a caller. It's Brother 
Malik. Good morning, Brother Malik. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing well. How about yourself? I woke up. I'm great, man. How can we help uh, you? Well, I don't know how much praise the good brother is getting, Brother Malik Shabazz, and I would like to thank him. You know, didn't get an opportunity to meet him, but I was out there when he was organizing in Charleston, South Carolina, with our little tragedy. So I would just like to, you know, thank him very much, and may God bless him, and may he continue to keep doing his good work. All right, brother. Well, thank you. All righty. Thank you, too, for having me. All right. Take care. So... Well, Charleston really got hit with some severe flooding recently, so they would have the same issue, um, you know, in terms of this disaster relief, because as, as soon as FEMA identifies an area as eligible for disaster relief, you know, that's when they would go to apply for it. So this would have impacted them. It impacts you know, kind of everybody and anybody. Wherever there's a disaster, and if FEMA declares it as a disaster that they will support and help, so, again, we can look at the big ones, Sandy and Katrina, but if there's a disaster earthquake in California or f- – did, did FEMA come in with all of those big fires in California? Yes. yes. So fires, earthquakes, storms, flooding. Tornado, we really don't know what, you know, tragedy might occur. So all those people in the Midwest, you know, I lived four years in California, and one of the reasons – I don't want like to talk about this because I feel chicken, but that's okay. I, I didn't like those those earthquakes. When that building yeah. rocked, I could not get used to it. Growing up in West Virginia, we just didn't have earthquakes. A lot of snow, but no earthquakes. I know what you mean. We had a little mini earthquake here in uh, Virginia and Washington, D.C., and, and it really was scary. You just, uh, I don't know. And I was in my office, and it felt like someone had taken a big, hammer and hit the side of the building. It was a, it was a big noise, boom. Yeah, and so everything shook. We ran outside to see what it was and then found out it was an earth- And then you could not get cell phone. And I thought maybe the towers were out or something, but it said everybody was on the phone. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, well, that's what happens, I guess. Yeah. So any disaster can happen anywhere. And so I really encourage you to go to contacting uh, the congress.org and uh, asking your congressperson to support and be a co-sponsor to this bill, which is H.R. 3863. Vernon, and then you were asking me about how to um, find the co-sponsors. Mm-hmm. And as I said, you go to Thomas, and then you uh, put in the bill number, the H.R. 3863, and then it has you know various categories that you can click on, and one of them is co-sponsors. And when you hit Thomas, do you see what the dot is? Congress dot um, Thomas dot what? I just do. T- I just search Thomas. You Google and, it, Thomas, and the Library of Congress comes up. Okay, it didn't no, come I up on mine, but I, 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 gov. I just want Thomas. So. I got it. I, I put Thomas Library, and then Library of Congress came up. It didn't come up before, so I see it. Thomas. Okay, and so I hit on that search bill summary and status. Okay. I'm learning. Fantastic. (laughs) Okay. One of the other things I have found out, Judy, in this program, you know, we've been on it two years now. Uh, October was our second year. We were only going to do it for a month, but it's been highly successful in that there's a lot of people in the co-op world that like to tell their story and people like to listen to it. So I've had a lot of people come on that would say that the cooperators, the people and let me just give this quick definition. A co-op is any business you can think of. If it's, It depends on who owns and controls it. If it's owned and controlled by the employees, it's called a worker cooperative. And that, that can be any business. Uh, we, we, we've had people, Equal Exchange, that, that buys products from farmers, small farmers, and fair trade throughout the world, and they sell it to co-ops, uh, food co-ops, and other places, and they're also setting up cafes. We've had a a um, worker cooperative. No, I've had several worker cooperatives. One I was getting ready to talk about is the second form, and that is uh, if it's owned by the people, owned and controlled by the people that buys or use the products or services, it's called a consumer cooperative. Credit unions are example. Housing co-ops are example. And then we had um, a group out of Madison, a uh, business out of Madison, Wisconsin, where the patients owned a clinic, a health clinic. 
And I thought that was very exciting to me because in a co-op, the people that own and control it make the decisions. So you have a patient-centric healthcare facility, which I think would be a little bit different than perhaps people that own it that want to make money. You make different kinds of decisions uh, in a cooperative, and that's the reason I brought that up. But one of the things that's come up over and over, Judy, is in these Thursday sessions, conversations, is that people that get into co-ops, they learn a lot. And when they learn, when they learn all of these things about how you run a business and how you work cooperatively and how it's democratically controlled, then they will go out and run for school boards or run for city councils or run for Congress because they get to know how the, how this works and how their decision is so important. So I would encourage everybody out there to get involved because I have even gotten more involved, Judy, in in local politics because I know that my voice matters. So I will encourage more and more people to do that. Judy, we have one more session. We have another break to go to, but I'd like to come back and talk about different types of other issues. We've talked about FEMA so we could get the idea down of how this process works and how you can get people to come together and how you can get to your congressmen and so forth to get bills passed and then get people to support those bills so you can get them passed. But we'll come back. We'll take our last break. And if you could, when we come back, if you could talk to us about other issues that you're working on, I would appreciate it. And I'm sure our listeners would, too. Please don't touch the dial. 1450 WOL. Information is power. You know, the National Cooperative customers are cooperative. We've already talked about that. There are cooperatives such as grocery wholesale co-ops, purchasing co-ops, or housing co-ops. Other customers share in the spirit of cooperation driven by democratic organizing principles. They may be Alaskan or Native American enterprises, which by their very nature are member-run and member-owned. Others may be community health centers or charter schools driven entirely by community need. What they all have in common is a single fundamental principle that they have joined together cooperatively to meet personal, social, or business needs. People helping be, um, people helping people solving community problems. Uh, Judy, what are some of the other issues that you deal with? Well, another um, important issue that I'm working on has to do with uh, reverse mortgages for housing cooperatives. Currently, HUD has not released guidelines to allow housing cooperatives to access home loan guarantees, HUD home loan guarantees. And um, Can I stop you a minute, Judy? Uh, you mentioned HUD, and I want to make sure everybody knows that HUD is Housing and Urban Development. It's a Department of Housing and Urban, urban Development. But now, t- can you tell us first what a reverse mortgage is, and are they good or bad? Well, both. <laughs> <laughs> um, a, a reverse mortgage, if you have... Um, Uh, When you own your home, you purchase a mortgage, and then you make monthly payments to pay it off. And so those monthly payments add up, and at a certain point, you have built up enough equity to be able to apply to get some of that money back. Okay, let me Um, me, me stop you a minute. It's still a loan. You know, it would be like a um, second mortgage or something. Let me try to see if I can get this straight. But you got – if you bought a house uh, 20 years ago – and you pay two hundred thousand dollars for it, and you 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 got a mortgage for that. Let's say you were able to get you, you put down ten percent, twenty thousand. So you got a mortgage for one hundred eighty thousand dollars. You paid it down for twenty years. You had a thirty year mortgage, so you probably paid down at least another hundred and ten thousand dollars now. So say you owe seventy thousand dollars, and not that two hundred thousand dollar home that you bought twenty years ago is now worth three hundred thousand dollars. So you owe seventy thousand. So you have equity of two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Okay. That's correct. Okay. So, um, and I should say that these reverse mortgages are often referred to as home equity conversion mortgages. The acronym for that is HECMs, Home Equity Conversion Mortgages. And so you can apply for a very uh, low interest rate through HUD. I mean, you get the HUD guarantee, and then you can apply to get a reverse mortgage to try to get back some of that equity. We would advise...
advise people to only use them in emergencies, but people have, you know, life-threatening illnesses, they need extra money, they have, um, you know, sometimes, you know, they're in a financial crisis, um, an economic crisis, you know, they've lost their job, their debts are building up, and so then it might be a good idea to... um, to take out a reverse mortgage to help you um, pay down that debt or pay off those hospital bills. You know, so that's the good news in terms of a reverse mortgage. Uh, We and HUD and AARP and any of the other organizations involved in in this issue do not recommend that people take out, you know, all of the money they can and go on a cruise because in the event of an emergency, that won't be there for them. There's also another issue if you were thinking of leaving something to your children, to your heirs. So this will impact, you know, the amount of money that your heirs uh, will receive. So, me, so um, that me, would be... Let me try to say one more thing. Judy, um, so you got a, you got $230,000 equity in the example that I gave before, and you can go then get a reverse mortgage of some of that equity. Uh, Let's say you decide you want to take $100,000 out. Now, you go get the mortgage of $100,000, but then um, you can still stay in the house. And you still live in the house. You've taken out $100,000. Do you have to pay back on that $100,000? You can if you want to, but you don't necessarily have to. When the house is sold, it will be taken out then. So if you if you take it out to hundred thousand dollars at some interest rate, then um, you don't have to pay it back. But if you live another ten years or whatever, <clears throat> that interest would come up, would keep go- going up. And then at the end, when you pass away or sell the house, then whatever that is, you have to pay that back at that point in time. That's true. So your equity, you're taking your equity out now to use it. And so what you recommend people to do or people that you know is don't take it out to go spend that $100,000 for cruises and clothes and a new car or something, 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 because it'll be gone and you won't have it anymore. And then if you do need to go get it, you won't have that equity. So so the, the wisdom is only go take that money out in a reverse mortgage if there's some huge need. Yes, I mean that's our, our our recommendation. You know, it may be that you need ten thousand for your daughter's wedding. You know, I mean that's legitimate. Um, so, um, although I'm not sure, ten thousand is. I was going to say that. <laughs> I, I, I breathe. I breathe in. <laughs> um, but um, but you know that's a that's a, that's legitimate. I guess it's just be smart about this. It's not okay. free money. You will be paying. You know. A, a very low interest rate on it, and uh, but that that interest rate will be locked in at a very low rate. Say it's three or four percent. You know that that's a pretty good interest rate. Mm-hmm. You know, so be smart about it. I guess is and, and if housing cooperatives are allowed to use um, to avail themselves of the home equity mortgage conversion mortgages, you know we will uh, have an education campaign to make sure that people are smart about about using that that equity that they've built up in their homes. So you've gotten to a really good uh, topic here, and that is that in a co-op or a condo or an HOA or a single-family home, they're all purchased. They're all owned, and some people don't know that about co-ops, that you own it, and this is one of the reasons that you are working through NAHC and, and others because the law already exists on the books, HUD just has to write the policies about it. And so you're trying well, to get HUD, is that correct, first? Yeah, it, it, they're called the guidelines, yes. Guidelines. I mean, the law was passed in 2000, and um, in 2008, HUD issued um, what's called a notice of proposed rulemaking um, that would list, that lists the guidelines that they would release, but then they never uh, promulgated the rule. So we're just stuck, um, and it's been 15 years. Okay. <laughs> so a long time coming here. Um, and, you know, we can't seem to get HUD to budge on this. We're encouraging people to contact both their senators and representatives and, you know, ask them 
to um, allow, uh, you could even say HECM, because everybody knows that acronym on the Hill, HECMs for housing cooperatives. They'll know just what you're talking about. I, I also recommend that, that when you're contacting Congress that you say something about yourself, something along the lines of, you know, I'm a member of a 1,000-unit housing cooperative or a 100-unit uh, housing cooperative, and then, and we would like to see HECMs for housing cooperatives. You know, uh, please support, please contact HUD to ask them to release the guidelines. Okay, so I've got another one to do to get another gold star. That's right. Okay. That's right, you're really working right down the list <laughs> okay. here. <laughs> I live in a 57-unit co-op, and I manage maybe seven co-ops right now. So I will oh my. push so, that out to get people. Sometimes all it takes is, you know, for you to contact them and, and say that and ask, you know, whoever is the president of the seven co-ops that you manage to do the same thing and say the same thing. I represent, you know, 200 housing cooperative units, and we would like to have HUD release the guidelines for um, HECMs for co-ops. <laughs> Okay. All right, you're giving me homework to do. Thank you. I know, really. <laughs> but, but you know, this is a fairness issue. All other homeowners are able to avail themselves of these um, mortgages, and it's, it's a fairness issue. It's wrong that we're not able to. So condos and HOAs and single-family homeowners, they can get a reverse mortgage, but we can't in a co-op. Uh, that's true, and and I'm going to get just a little bit deeper into this, and I kind of hate, we call it getting into the weeds, and I kind of hate to do it. <laughs> the only problem, though, is we only, have, we only have about one minute, so you have to do it very quickly. Ah, okay. Well, the reason why HUD's reluctant to do it is because uh, housing cooperatives purchase shares in the cooperative. That's how they end up having, they're entitled to occupy their unit, um, but they're considered personal property. Whereas, you know, condominiums and uh, single-family homeowners, they're considered real property. Because they have a deed of so, trust. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's what's the roadblock for us. Judy, do you like what you're doing? Oh, I love it. I really do. I enjoy it. Um, uh, you know, nobody ever opposes our issues. It's a matter of getting things done. And I think it's very important, this fairness issue. Uh, is something that really gets me, I guess. Okay. Um, you know, to to make sure that that people are treated fairly. You know, all homeowners should be treated the same. Totally agree, and that's a great place to stop. We thank you very much for being on, Judy, and for taking out the time. And we thank everybody out there for listening. We'll be back next Thursday, and until then, have a great day and work cooperatively. Thank you, Judy. Thanks, Vernon. Right. Bye. 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 Fourteen fifty. W-O-L.